day after Christmas in 2010, and Catherine Kleiss was really excited about the upcoming week. She and her husband, Jack Wheeler, had started this tradition where the week between Christmas and New Year's, they would turn off their cell phones, close their laptops, they wouldn't work, and they would just sit around watching movies together the whole week. But that day, Jack would tell Catherine, much to her dismay, that he wasn't going to be around for that week because he had business in Washington, D.C., and it was really important and he couldn't miss it. Catherine was really upset and disappointed and initially kind of lashed out at Jack, but Catherine would say that she wasn't exactly surprised. Jack was was a prominent consultant and a former Pentagon official. He traveled a ton for work. So Jack leaves for this trip and Catherine kind of anticipates that they're not gonna speak while he's gone. They didn't really end on good terms and typically when they fought, they would go long periods of time without talking to each other. But as much as Catherine wanted to be stubborn and not talk to him, they had a wedding they were supposed to go to together at the end of the week and Catherine needed to coordinate travel with Jack. And so after a couple of days that he's been in DC and she hasn't heard from him, she puts her ego aside and she calls him. Her call went straight to voicemail. And then she called a couple more times. And again, all of them went straight to voicemail. She texted him, no response. She emailed him, no response. Catherine interprets this as Jack trying to ignore her and she's furious. And she ends up going to the wedding by herself. After the wedding was over, she gets back to her house and she still hasn't heard from Jack, but she's so mad and so stubborn that he was doing this on purpose. She still didn't think anything was wrong. She really believed that he was stonewalling her. But on January 2nd, 2011, Catherine would get a phone call that would show her that Jack was never stonewalling her. He was never ignoring her. He was dead. Back on the day after Christmas, right after Jack has told Catherine that, sorry, I'm not gonna be around this week, he gathers up his things and he heads to the Amtrak train station and boards a train to Washington, D.C. Jack arrives in Washington, D.C. and for the next couple of days, he has a very ordinary business trip. On December 28th, the day he's supposed to come home, things get a little bit weird. Instead of going back to New York where he lived with Catherine, he bought a train ticket to go to Wilmington, Delaware. Now, he owned a house about 20 minutes away from Wilmington, but he had never indicated to Catherine or to anyone in his family that he'd be spending any time at this residence following this trip. No one knows what Jack did that night in Delaware or where he stayed. All we know is on the following day, on December 29th, he got in a cab and asked to go to a particular hotel in Wilmington. The police would get in touch with this cab driver who would say he was completely normal. He just looked like a business guy that wanted to go to this hotel. We had small talk in the cab and I dropped him off and that was it. Around 9.30 in the morning that day, Jack sends an email to his company that says his home has been broken into and his cell phone along with his badge, his work badge and a key fob and his briefcase case have all been stolen. After that email, we don't know what Jack did over the course of that day because he was not spotted again until 6 p.m. that night when he walked into a pharmacy and walked up to a random pharmacist and said, hey, can you give me a ride somewhere? The pharmacist would tell police that when Jack came in there and asked him for a ride, he looked really upset but overall, more or less put together. He had a suit on, he looked like he genuinely just needed some help, but the pharmacist just had a weird feeling about it and said, look, I can't give you a ride, but I'd be happy to call you a cab. Jack would decline the offer for a cab and would leave the pharmacy. 40 minutes later, a surveillance camera in a parking garage would capture Jack acting totally bizarre. He walks into frame and immediately it's like something's off about him. His suit looks kind of wrinkled and rumpled and he's walking with a limp and he's only got one shoe on because the other shoe is being held in his other hand for some reason. He goes up to the attendant and he points his finger at them like he's upset about something. And apparently what he was saying to them is, someone stole my briefcase, but there's no audio on the footage. And then he turns and walks down the hall and he opens up a door into the garage, pokes his head around like he's looking for something, shuts the door and comes back. And Apparently he was saying to the attendant, I'm looking for my car, can you help me find it? And no one really knew what to do with the guy. And just as quickly as he had arrived and made this kind of weird scene, he abruptly left and didn't tell anyone where he was going. Nobody knows where he went after the parking garage or where he stayed that night. But the next day on December 30th, Jack walked into this high rise office building. He goes right up to the front desk attendant in the lobby and he asked to speak with a managing partner at one of the law firms that was inside of this office building. The attendant calls up to the law firm and the lawyer is notified who says he'll be down in a minute. But by the time he got down to the lobby to meet with Jack, Jack was gone. 
We don't know what Jack did after he left the office building, but several hours later that night, Jack is picked up to the north of this building in an area called Rodney Square, and he's making his way over to the relatively dangerous part of the city known as the East Side. Jack had also changed his outfit at this point. He was now wearing a sweatshirt with the hood up. The next time anybody saw Jack, he was being poured out of a dump truck into a landfill and he was dead. The worker who spotted Jack's body being poured into the landfill called the police. The police show up and they were able to determine based on the truck that Jack had been in that he was picked up from a dumpster that was in Newark, Delaware, not Wilmington, Delaware, which means Jack's body was somehow in a dumpster 13 miles away from where he was last seen on camera in Rodney Square. Police quickly ruled this a homicide and it was determined that his cause of death was blunt force trauma. He had been beaten to death. But to this day, no one has any idea who did it or why, or why Jack was acting as strangely as he was in those final few days in Delaware. Now his wife and his family have watched the videos of him on surveillance acting very strangely and they say he's not acting crazy, he's acting scared. Here is the surveillance footage of Jack when he was at the parking garage walking around with one shoe on. So that's going to do it, guys. Let me know what you thought of these three stories in the comment section, and I will pin the best comment at the top of the comment section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please replace the like button's melatonin pills with caffeine pills. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's just John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it, guys. See ya.